so I'm a professor, I'm an author, and I'm also a consultant. And so I take the best research on behavior change and try to translate it to help as many people as possible in as many situations as possible. So I work with my students and I help them both learn the material and begin to grow as leaders themselves. And then in the consulting work, I translate this into the market economy. How can these ideas help people build a better app that can more effectively help folks? How can these ideas really connect your business values with what your customer needs. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the self-improvement industry, and I'm one of very few people in the world who actually can claim to be an expert on self-help books. Uh, it is an $11 billion a year industry in the United States alone, and untold billions worldwide. And yet, people don't take it very seriously. We think of it as, oh, those are just sort of motivational books and, uh, and not worth studying academically. Well, my personal motto is from Seneca, um, not for school, but for life we learn. And so I believe that those everyday texts tell us a lot about who we are now and who we want to become. Business self-help is a huge percentage of the self-help market, first of all. And these are books that tell you how to comport yourself at the office, but more so how to figure out what matters to you as an individual and how to bring those things into your professional work. For leaders in particular, you know, there's this tension. Is a great leader born or are they made? And certainly in these sort of self-improvement books, we believe that leadership can and should be taught. Now, there are some real kind of core virtues of leadership that uh, not all business self-help focuses on. And that to me is a differentiator between the best and the mediocre. So business self-help and leadership self-help that focuses on asking those questions of who are you, what matters to you, why does it matter, and then how can you make it happen in your organization, those are the ones that are really going to be the winners. So we like to sort of think about other people reading self-help books and those other people are the people who have problems, but we don't. But it turns out that the, uh, the reader of self-help books tends to be more educated, more affluent, and more successful than most. Why? Well, it's because if you have some of those skills, you know their value and you want more of them. And so that's what so many of these good leadership self-help books can provide. The challenge, though, between just buying a self-help book and maybe attending a leadership seminar is that buying a self-help book is a fairly low cost and thus a weak commitment to change. Whereas if you invest time with a coach in a seminar at a leadership organization that's going to follow up with you, then you know that you are making a really costly and much more valuable commitment to what you believe in. I like to think of self-help generally as a, a sort of a, a thing that will help you along the way, but that's not going to get you all the way there. So if you are in therapy, a therapist might provide a psychological self-help book of some sort. If you are trying to um, change yourself with a workout regimen or, or a diet, a book can give you the sort of do's and don'ts. But community really matters here. And so this is where doing a program with someone, with your team, with a coach, that's what's going to hold you accountable and take those good bits of advice and turn them into great actions in your own life. <laughs> Yes. There are self-help books that tell you, if you follow exactly what I tell you to do, you will be a success. Those are not true. Any book that has a closed system, 
that tells you it's my way or the highway, you want to steer clear of that. Self-help books that have an open system that invite you to customize to work with your organization. Those are the ones that are really very good. Also ones that blame you either by saying you're a victim and, um, oh, for example, your cheese moved, one of the uh, Who Moved My Cheese books, um, or saying you can do this and by the way if you don't do it it's all your fault because you didn't do it well those are tough too so that victimization and empowerment in self-help books is something to look out for <music> to lead on purpose you got to ask yourself three questions what matters most to me why does it matter? And then how can I make it happen? And those three questions are questions that all of us can ask no matter how old or young we are. But for young adults who are just starting on their leadership journey, really knowing what their values are, what their strengths are, who they hope to positively impact in the world, these are the core elements of what will make them a strong leader and really kind of be a guiding light on the path to whatever career they choose. So when my students come to me and say, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life, I say, that's fabulous. Don't worry about it. Anybody who tells you they've got their whole life planned out is either lying or they're going to change their mind next week. So I tell everybody that they should approach life with a purpose mindset, not a singular life goal, but really a sort of frame of questions about what matters. And if you do that, it opens you up to all sorts of possibilities. There's a wonderful bit of, um, of research that came out of, a, of Stanford University a couple years ago, and it's called Happenstance Learning Theory. And Happenstance Learning Theory is this wonderful idea that life happens. Right? And so to be a success in life means to take in all of those inputs and to uh, be able to say yes to opportunity, be able to know yourself en enough to know what matters and what the next step should be, but then also to kind of roll with it because guess what? Life doesn't always go as planned. And when life doesn't go as planned, that's when you got to embrace that purpose and figure out what you're going to do next. I think your purpose can evolve as your roles evolve. So, for example, I have a purpose as a professor and in my professional life. But you know what? I also have a purpose as a mom. And, and that, that sort of calling and purpose as a mom wasn't there 10 years ago before I had children. So, you know, as we go, grow through all the life stages, I think we've got to be pretty flexible. Again, life happens. You can't predict what's going to come next, but knowing your core values and knowing what really matters to you will help you make those difficult decisions along the way. You can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. Now, one of the pet peeves that I have is that so many of my female students still say to me, well, I, I just want to get married and have kids, so I don't need to push ahead with an advanced degree. Or, I'll do it later, and that's probably not a priority for me right now. This drives me crazy in 2018 that we're still having some of these conversations. Getting education, and that competitive advantage is incredibly important for women. Being able to choose your own adventure as much as you can, to make your own schedule, is an incredible blessing if you can be in a career that allows it. But it's very hard to be going full throttle in your career and trying to spend as much time in your personal life as you want. And so, at least for me, there's always been a compromise. Sometimes I can go all guns blazing at work and then, and then I'm going to spend a bunch of time at home. This doesn't have to be in year-long or two-year-long increments. We can even think about it as like a week at a time. But giving yourself the structure and the forgiveness to say, this is when I'm going to focus on my professional life, this is when I'm going to focus on my home life, and don't forget, 
This is when I'm going to focus on myself and to recharge those batteries. Giving yourself time and space for all of that, it's easier said than done, but you can't do it all, all the time. But that doesn't mean you can't do it all in the time that you have. So I am working on a new book um, with a co-author who is a psychiatrist and he and I are looking at ancient practices for modern well-being. And so I study self-improvement and so many people are increasingly interested in um, these sort of ancient practices like sweat lodges and psychedelics uh, as an antidepressant treatment. And there's a lot of in information out there that just isn't good. There are a lot of practitioners who are taking it to an extreme that's even dangerous. And so what we're looking at is the research about what works and what doesn't, and can we supercharge our human well-being by actually looking back at the past and have a better future. I teach a course called Consuming Happiness about how we try to buy happiness successfully and unsuccessfully in the marketplace. But I also teach a course called Eco You, Belonging, Purpose, and the Ecology of Human Happiness. And so yes, I'm, I'm looking at well-being because you can't separate physical well-being from emotional well-being. You know, people, uh, young people, when they say what's sort of important to them, they never list their health unless they're struggling with a health problem. But as we age, we understand that without having that sense of well-being, a lot of other things become more challenging. So c could we supercharge our mental and physical well-being in ways that are actually more ancient than they are modern? And so that's what my next research is. <laughs>